Can a Christian take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven? Very interesting question. A lot of people have wondered about that. And uh, one of the proofs that you can know that this book here is of God or not is can it accurately predict the future? Now this has been said before in some of my other sermons, but the fact of the matter is if this book is truly written by the God of the universe, the God of the universe would be outside of our time, outside of this, outside of this dimension, so he shouldn't be constrained by time. In other words, he should be able to see into the past, to the present, and also to the future, if it truly is a holy book. Okay, So the test of prophecy is one of the most important tests to verify the accuracy of the Bible. Now, if you know Bible prophecy, you'll know if you go to Matthew chapter 24, one of the most popular uh, chapters, we're not going to go there right now, but there are numerous signs that are given, things like earthquakes in divers places, um, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, all those different things. Now, the, the whole thing about that is a lot of people are skeptical because they say that, you know, there have always been rumors of wars and wars. There have always been earthquakes. There have always been famines and pestilences. So people can say, well, they were in the past and they're in the future now. And they are, you know, they are increasing, but that's just the course of history. People conduct that, in other words. But there's one prophecy in particular that nobody can say has ever happened before. There's never been a point in time when all people have been one nation under the authority of one power, and say, oh, that's happened in the past. Yeah, the Roman Empire and the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, understand that. But there's never been a time when there's been a one-world government and a cashless system of in the economy. Okay, that's never happened before. And the Bible does give a prediction that there would be this thing called the mark of the beast, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. And we're going to look at that in the study today. We're going to see what the mark of the beast is and what's included with taking the mark. And we're also going to see what happens to those who take it. And we're going to see the developments right now that are leading to this technology coming up. It's going to be a very interesting study today. So first we're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And... Uh, what you're going to see here is that while this book was written uh, in the past, there are many things that line up with what's going on today. And uh, this is the next event that's going to happen on the prophetic time scale, if you will. If you will. This is going to be a, a major, major event. Uh, it's going to shock a lot of people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. It says here, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here you have what many call the rapture. Okay? And it's specifically so the pre-tribulation rapture. We're going to get into that as we continue that this thing happens before the Antichrist is revealed. But uh, the point is, has this happened yet? No. Is this speaking poetically about something that happened in the past? No. This is a literal event where the Lord is actually going to call away the Christians. The dead go up first, and then the living go up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And the saved Christians are the only ones that are going to go up. You're not going to go up if you're a good person. Okay, don't be deceived into thinking that. But let's continue here. Go down to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, we're going to read down to uh, verse 11. And I want you to notice the contrast here. God is a God of distinction. Okay, The Bible is a great book distinguishing between right and wrong, between heaven and hell, between you know righteousness and sin. And God is a God of distinction. And I want you to see the distinctions here between saved people called ye, you, yours, you know, things like that, and then the lost, they, them, you know, others, you know, you'll see that. Verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
In other words, it's, you're not going to have time to get saved, okay? If you're waiting and thinking, oh, maybe I'll get saved tomorrow or something. Maybe I'll get saved right when the rapture is happening. Nope, you aren't going to have time. Verse 3, for when they, notice the loss there, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and look at this, and they shall not escape. All right, and you're going to see what people, these, the Christians are going to be escaping as we continue in this study. Verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake, the living, or sleep, those that are dead, we should live together with him Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So you see there, a Christian is not to be in darkness. We're not to sleep like the lost world. So somebody like myself, somebody like you out there, if you're saved, you can look at this world and you can say, wow, we are getting so close to the rapture happening. And you say it to your lost co-workers, they go, huh? What, the rapture? The end of the world? What are you talking about? And by the way, you say, well, then you're saying that the end of the world is coming soon. No, actually, the end of the world isn't going to be for a long time, at least 1,007 years from now. Okay, the end of the world's a very long way off. Uh, this world's going to be here for a while yet. Okay, don't be deceived into thinking that I'm talking about the end of the world. I'm not. That's going to seem like the end of the world to, to many people. Uh, if you miss the rapture, it will seem like it. But the whole point is, as a Christian, you're not supposed to be like the lost world. You're not supposed to look at the world and think, oh, things are getting better. You know, we're heading for happy times. You know, in spite of the fact that Russia and North Korea and China have numerous times threatened the United States saying, don't do this or don't do that because we'll go to war. And, and we have pending wars here and pending wars there. And World War III could blow up at any time. And there's nuclear weapons all over the place. And oh, just ignore that. And we'll just say that things are getting better. Sure. Right. No, if you're a Christian, if you have some spiritual discernment, you can see, hey, things are getting bad, and this is what the Bible predicted. Okay? But you see there that there's a group of people that are going to escape this time that's coming, this, this horrible time that is written about specifically in the book of Revelation. But let's continue here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go to the next book in your Bible there. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. And the question comes up, you say, that, okay, I see there that the dead in Christ arise, they rise first, the living go up second. And, uh, and you know, there's these people that escape. When's this going to happen? Well, we'll see about that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 says, says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, Remember, Paul had written to the Thessalonians before and told them about this. Verse 2, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day... Now, let me just... I got ahead of myself there. What's the day of Christ? Well, one day with the Lord as, is as a thousand years. If you read back, about that back in 2 Peter chapter 3. So what's going on there? Well, the day there, the thousand-year day, starts with the second advent of Jesus Christ. And so that day of Christ would be that thousand-year beginning with the second advent and going in through the millennial kingdom. And people are saying that this day is at hand. And Paul says, no, there are some things that have to happen before the day of Christ comes. Let's read about it. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now this character, this man that does this, this man of sin, the son of perdition, is what the Bible would call the Antichrist. Okay, this man that's going to come, he's going to be a perfect counterfeit for Jesus Christ. 
right? If you know your Bible and you've seen some of the other studies that I've done, you'll see that Satan always counterfeits what Jesus Christ is doing or who Jesus Christ is. Satan is a master counterfeiter. So Satan is going to come out with a counterfeit Christ that will come to this earth first, before Jesus Christ. And the whole world's going to worship him. We're going to see that a little bit later. But you see there, two things have to happen. There shall come a falling away first. Now, what's the falling away? Well, falling away from the stands that Christianity always took. And we certainly see that today. The first of those signs has come to pass. Now you say, oh, then the second one's going to come, come to pass before the rapture. No, the man of sin being revealed doesn't happen until after the Christians are gone. You say, can you prove that? Let's keep reading. Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? That would be the first letter to them. There, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But uh, continuing, verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth, withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Hmm. You say, what's that about? Well, who's the he might be revealed? That would be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. The guy that's written about there in verse uh, 3 and 4. But what's the his time? Might be revealed in his time. Well, that would be the time where the body of Christ is on the earth. You know, um, again, I've done a lot of studies on this. I don't want to get too far off my subject. But the fact is, Paul was persecuting Christians. And when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Paul never actually, well, Saul at the time, but he never actually persecuted Jesus in the flesh, did he? Nobody persecuted the church, and the church is the body of Christ. So the his time there, what's the his time? The his time is there are Christians on the earth that are actually part of the body of Christ. Spiritually, we're connected to Jesus Christ. So the Antichrist cannot show up while the body of Christ is on the earth. Let's continue. I'm going to prove this to you. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, the spirit of Antichrist is already here. People would already be ready to worship him. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Hmm. Now what's going on there? He who now letteth will let. What's the word let mean? Well, if you play tennis, when you hit the ball and it hits the net, they say let. Well, what happened there? Well, something hindered the ball from going to the opponent. The net did. Something stopped the ball in its motion. The same way that something is stopping this Antichrist from showing up. What would that be? That'd be the Holy Spirit. Okay? You say, well, then the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way? No. Until he be taken out of the way, well, who's the he? That would be the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is hindering, is letting the Antichrist from showing up until the body of Christ leaves. That's called proper scripture interpretation. Not uh, reading a commentary somewhere with a guy that thinks that he knows what he's doing or has to go to Greek or Hebrew to correct the text because he can't handle the text. Compare scripture with scripture. All right? And you say, well, Brian, you're just using one verse. That's not proving anything. What well, we're going to see about that. I'm going to show you that a member of the body of Christ a very special member of the body of Christ, leaves before the Antichrist shows up. And that there are other people up there that are members of the body of Christ before the Antichrist shows up. I'm going to prove it to you. But let's continue here. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Remember that for later. Remember this wicked that comes with the power of Satan. That's going to be important later. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Right now, let me just give you a little bit of a warning. If you're watching this video right now and you're saying, you know what, Brian, I'm really not ready to get saved yet because I just don't want to give up my life of sin, you are having pleasure in unrighteousness. And if you're rejecting Jesus Christ being the atonement for your sins and the 
command in Scripture to become a new creature after you get saved. If you're rejecting that, there's a good chance that God is going to send you that strong delusion. If you don't make it to the rapture, if you don't get saved, excuse me, before the rapture, God's actually going to send you strong delusion. If you're watching this video, and I know a lot of people watch these videos, you know, I get a lot of atheists and things watching this. I'm not telling you this stuff to try and, and put you down or try and show that I have superior intellect or anything. I'm saying this because I'm trying to warn you. Uh, things are going to get real bad after the rapture. Really bad. I don't want anybody to go through that. That's why I'm doing this study. It's very, very important. Okay? Because as you're going to see later on, there's something that happens in the future, specifically so the mark of the beast, and if you take that thing, there's no more forgiveness. There's no more chance to, well, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Mm -mm. You see, there's nothing that you can do right now in this current time as the body of, when the body of Christ is on the earth. There's nothing that you can do that the Lord won't forgive. Okay, but uh, that's not going to be true in the future. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll continue here. Okay, so the body of Christ is removed before the Antichrist shows up. You say, well, Brian, you've only showed one verse of Scripture. Okay, let's go to the book of Revelation. Now we're going to do a big study here in the book of Revelation. I'm going to show you that there are Scriptures that prove exactly what I'm saying. Revelation chapter 4 is where you want to go. Having to deal with some wind here. Oh, the joys of outdoor sermons. All right, Revelation chapter 4. Now, if you know your book of Revelation, who is it written by? It's written by John, okay, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So, was John part of the body of Christ? Is John part of the body of Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see what happens here. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Hmm. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, you have another account of the rapture. And in that passage, it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, you say, what is that? Did you see it? There it was again. A moment, twinkling of an eye. That quick. That means if you're standing there and there's a Christian in front of you and the rapture happens, and they're gone. They aren't saying, wow, I just heard from the Lord, the rapture's going to be in another half hour. Would you like to be saved? Mm -mm. Like that, and gone. There's no time. There's no time to say, oh, wait a second, I wanted to get saved. There's no time. Gone. That's what's going on here in Revelation chapter 4. A member of the body of Christ looks up to heaven, he sees a door open, and he hears a voice, and it says, come up hither. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Boom, he's up. Just like that. Look at verse 3. What does he see when he gets up there to heaven? And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Huh. So there are men up there, elders. Who are they? Well, let's keep reading. Go to Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 12. Get a little bit more insight here into who these men are. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, now look at this, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So you say, who are the 24 elders? 
Well, many people try to say the 12 sons of Jacob that were the heads of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. No, because those men were all Jews. You see there it says that they are redeemed by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. You say then, who are the 24 elders? Honestly, I've looked at this thing, I've read commentaries, I've contacted different brethren, and I have never gotten one right answer. You say, who are they? We'll find out when we get there, if you're saved. Okay? I really don't know who they are. But one thing is clear. They're Christians. God wasn't dealing with other nations back in the Old Testament. But he does now. So, if the body of Christ goes through this time with the Antichrist and everything else, why are there blood-redeemed saints in heaven before it gets started? And why are they crowned? The crowns come at the judgment seat of Christ. See, there's big problems if you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. There's a whole lot of doctrinal issues that you're going to get messed up in. But you see that thing there, there are 24 elders in heaven before the Antichrist shows up. We say, well, Brian, you didn't prove that yet. I'm getting there. I just have a way of kind of getting ahead of myself, you know. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6. Well, actually, let me read. You say, well, there's only 24 elders. I forgot I forgot two verses here. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Where are the rest of the Christians? I'll show you. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So you say, wait a second, Brian, you're teaching that, that Christians become angels? Uh-huh, that's right. You see back there in the Gospels, the one guy said to Jesus about, you know, whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? And Jesus says, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. Huh. And uh, back in the Old Testament, the term sons of God always refers to angels. Every single time. You say it's the sons of Seth. No, it isn't. The sons of God in the Old Testament are always angels. And in 1 John, in your New Testament, it talks about now are we the sons of God. Okay? There are angels that fell in the past. That's a whole other study. I'm not going to get into it right now. But the replacement for those sons of God, the replacement for those angels, are you and I, if you're saved. Okay, we're going to be as the angels of God in heaven. We'll be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We're going to look like Christ. All right, and we'll think like Christ, we'll look like Christ, and we're going to act like Christ. Finally, you know, because boy, Christians sure don't act like Christ, like Christ all the time down here on the earth, unfortunately. But uh, let's continue. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. When does the Antichrist show up in this whole thing? Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Okay, it says here, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, if you look in your center column reference there, or if you have a commentary, a lot of times it'll be in the footnotes, they'll actually refer you to Revelation chapter 19. And they try to say that the rider on the white horse here in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, is the same as the one in Revelation chapter 19. Oh, uh, no, they're not. And if you compare the two, you can see there's a big difference. First of all, this one has a crown. Revelation 19, Jesus Christ has many crowns. Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19 has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. This one has a bow in his hands. They're not the same. Okay? Not at all. Who is this? Well, what did I tell you earlier? Satan is a master counterfeiter. Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse in Revelation chapter 19. The Antichrist comes on a white horse. Hmm. He has a crown on his head. Now, he has a bow. He doesn't have the sharp sword coming out of his mouth. You mean to tell me that the Antichrist would come and not be speaking the word of God? He'd be given his own opinions? Hmm. You see, the word of God in Hebrews, I think it's chapter 4, verse 12, is likened to a sharp, two-edged sword. 
That's why when Jesus comes back, he uses the most powerful thing in the universe. You say, what's that, Brian? Right there. This King James Bible. The Lord speaks his word to wage his battle. The Antichrist comes back with a physical weapon, a bow in his hands. Hmm. Kind of like the uh, current uh, Antichrist system, you know, where you have a man that stands there like this and blesses. Like a bow. It all makes sense. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Okay. So, let me just say this before we continue here. So what do we learn? What have we learned so far? Well, somebody goes up to heaven and escapes this time period that's coming uh, before the Antichrist is reve revealed and unleashed on this world. Who is it? The body of Christ. So my sermon title was a bit a uh, trick question. It was kind of elusive. Can Christians take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven? Well, that's a trick question. You see, because there are no Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble, this great tribulation time period. They're not there. The body of Christ leaves before then. You say, well, then you're saying nobody's going to get saved in the tribulation? I didn't say that at all. But the people that get saved in the tribulation, more properly called the time of Jacob's trouble, those people are not part of the body of Christ. They're not Christians. Be why? Well, because if they take the mark, they're out. They're done. And we're going to see that as we continue here. But there's a popular teaching which has been circulated around, and we're going to be showing it later on, that people in the time of Jacob's trouble can take the mark and still go to heaven and still be okay with God. And I can tell you that is a, it is a lie, but it's not. I don't think the man that said it, I don't think he's that ignorant. I think he's a false prophet. I think he's a minister of Satan. Because you're going to see the scriptures are so plainly clear that anyone who takes that mark will go to hell. You're going to see that as we continue here. But uh, what about these people that get saved during the time of Jacob's trouble? Okay, What's going on with them? Well, interestingly, there are two groups. Let's continue here. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay? So what do we see there? God seals 144,000 Jews in their forehead. Now, what did I tell you earlier? Satan always counterfeits what God can do, or what God does. And we're going to see that here as we continue. But look here, you say, well, there are saved Jews. Are there going to be any saved other people, you know, Gentiles? Sure. Go down to verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It says, After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Very interesting. Okay? And you say, well, but Brian, they're Christians. You see? They're saved from all people, tongues, kindreds, nations. So they're just the same as we are today. They're the same as those elders, the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 5 that you read about. They were saved out of all kindreds, people, tongue, nation, you know? So they're just the same as today. Right? No. Because let's continue reading. Verse 13, jump down to verse 13. And one of the elders answered and sang unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they that came out of great tribulation, and, and have washed their robes, be important, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night. In his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. 
Okay, now I want you to notice two different things here. First of all, right now, God sees absolutely no distinction between saved Jews and saved Gentiles. So how do you know that? Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So if we're all one in Christ Jesus and there's neither Jew nor Greek there, uh, why is it that there's 144,000 chosen Jews and then a great multitude of Gentiles? Why? Because they're not Christians. You say, well, how do you know that? Look at the other part there. Sorry about that, my page blue here. Verse 14, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Hmm. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The church is purchased with the blood of God. You say, I thought it was Jesus Christ. There you go. Jesus Christ is God. So you have there, we are purchased with the blood. God's blood. I didn't see anything in there about a robe. About me washing my robe in the blood of the Lamb. No. You, didn't, you know why it wasn't seen? Because it's not for us. I know that's difficult for some people to get. You know, things are different or not the same. But uh, stick with it. You know, you'll get it. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Again, we're not washing our robes in the blood. We are washed. If you're saved, you are washed in the blood. You say, but how do you know that? Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It doesn't say, and who gave us the ability to wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. It doesn't say that. You say, well, if somebody else washes you, then that's not works. That's somebody doing the work for you. But now if I told you I'm going to have to go soon and wash this coat, is that me doing work? Yeah, of course. If I told you I have to, to be saved, I have to wash my robe in the blood of the Lamb. Is that works? Yeah. What's going on there? Well, if you look at Scripture and compare Scripture with Scripture, you see that white robes are oftentimes a, a symbol of righteousness. So in other words, these people in the time of Jacob's trouble are going to have to work to obtain salvation. You say, well, what kind of, you mean good works, keeping the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule and stuff like that? Huh. No, well, they will have to keep the commandments. We'll get into that later. But they're actually going to have to not take the mark in order to be saved. And we're going to see that as we continue. So what exactly is the mark of the beast? Okay, turn to Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to compare Scripture with Scripture here, ladies and gentlemen. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. It says here, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Who's the dragon? Continue reading. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now many people try to say that this happened before the book of Genesis. Uh, that is nonsense. Absolutely ridiculous. This did not happen yet. Okay, The devil and his angels have not been kicked out of heaven yet. It's going to be a future event. All right, But notice there, the devil gets kicked out of heaven. So he goes down to where? The earth. You got that? Let's continue. Revelation chapter 13. We're going to read this entire chapter because there's a lot of good stuff in here. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet 
were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Now look at this. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. What did we read back there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders? Hmm. Who are we talking about here? Who is this beast? The man of sin. The Antichrist, the son of perdition. That's who we're talking about here. Continue, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? We'll see later on who is. Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Three and a half years. Okay, And three and a half years times two, because in the midst of the week he sets himself up in the temple. So you have the tribulation time period, the time of Jacob's trouble is seven years. A lot of people are trying to deny that too. I mean, it's like, okay, you know, uh, people are really falling for some ridiculous heresies right now. But the Bible does teach seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. And three and a half years in is when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped. But uh, anyhow, let's continue. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That's why there's so many people up in heaven there in Revelation chapter 7. And by the way, the book of Revelation is not chronological. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that, that tells the story of Revelation, then it goes back and retells it in more detail, and then retells it in more detail. It's not chronological. Don't make the mistake of reading through it thinking everything is just going in sequence. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so when you see these saints being overcome and being killed, they're the ones that are showing up back there in Revelation chapter 7, up in heaven. All right. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that live, leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Who's the dragon? context here. Revelation chapter 12. Satan. It's very interesting because if you ever look at the picture of the Pope when he's wearing the one hat, it's got this long, you know, pointed thing that goes way up here and he turns to the side and it has two horns. Like that. We're going to see later on that the Roman Catholic Church is the false prophet system. That she, uh, the great, you know, Holy Mother Church rides on the beast, on the power and authority of the beast. We'll see that later. Okay. Um, verse 12, And he exerciseth, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Interesting there. Oh, well, let me continue here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Very interesting because most of your church buildings, the buildings that call themselves churches, have huge television screens in them now. So you could literally have, and you know, you say to somebody, where do you worship right now? What do they think of? They aren't going to think of a place like this right here. They aren't going to say, well, I go outdoors and I worship the Lord outdoors. Uh-uh. They would say, well, I go to whatever church. Don't they? And then you already have these huge television screens in these churches. Of course, you can watch my studies on what a church really is, and you'll see that buildings that are called churches have no basis in Scripture. But uh, that's a whole other issue. But the fact of the matter is, these television screens are already there. So all it would take is to have the beast stand up. He could address everybody in their church every Sunday morning. And they could worship him. So you see their worship 
associated with this beast. Well, who are they going to worship? Some political figure? Some guy stands up there, prime minister of Great Britain or something like this, or the president of the United States? Yeah, right. You know, people try to say Obama's the Antichrist. Come on. I don't like Obama very much. You know, he's the, the leader that's been put in authority here in America, I realize, but uh, he's not a very good man. But he's not the Antichrist. Okay? That's ridiculous. The Antichrist is going to be somebody that the whole world's going to worship. And if you remember what I said earlier, Satan counterfeits everything that the Lord does. And I believe that Satan is going to have a counterfeit, perfect counterfeit of Jesus Christ that will show up to be worshipped. Only he's not going to be Jesus Christ. He's going to be the Antichrist, the man of sin. But you see there, worship. Okay, now let's look here at the next verse. And here's where we're going to really start getting into this purpose of this study. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads. Now that's the King James reading here. All the new versions change it to on. No, we have implantable microchips that go in the hand, or in the forehead. We'll see about that later. Verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Six, six, six. Probably the most infamous number out there. Most people know about it. You say, well, Brian, how close are we to this thing? Well, right now we have this stuff right here. Right there. See? What is that? Well, it's called money. Now, actually, in reality, if you study the Constitution, we're not to have anything but gold and silver coin as payment in debts, both public and private. And I've said this in other studies. What's the difference between this and a $1 bill and a $100 bill? Ink. That's it. Okay? This is money, but it's not real money. Okay? In the sense of gold and silver. You can see the difference between a silver or a gold coin that's one-tenth of an ounce and a gold coin that's one ounce. You can obviously see the difference. You can feel a difference. You can't feel a difference. If you were blindfolded and somebody handed you this and handed you a $100 bill, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. There's no way to tell the difference. Okay. But now let me show you something else. Now, I can't show this thing, you know, but what do we have here? I'll do it this way. What do we got there? Bank check card. Now, go back 100 years ago and walk into a store and say, let me put this into one of your machines here and I'll slide it and I can buy whatever I want in here. They'd look at you and they'd say, uh, maybe you need to sit down for a little while you know, and drink some cool water or something like that. You know, just maybe take a pill or something. Take a nap or something for a while, you know, you might be sick. How about saying you can have one of these types of little things here as a microchip in your hand and walk through a scanner. You don't even have to take the card and scan it through something like that. Walk through a scanner and it can be automatically de deducted from your bank account. You say, does that technology exist? Oh sure, absolutely, totally, it's there. Did this ever happen in the past? No. You say, well, there have been earthquakes in the past. That's a sign. There have been wars and rumors of wars. There's been disease, pestilence, whatever else. There hasn't been the mark of the beast. Never. Look at history. Gold, silver, coins. Occasionally people bring out paper money. But for, for most of history, it's been coins as payment of debts, both public and private. Now all of a sudden we have plastic. And we have computers. You don't even have to get your credit card out or your check card or your bank card or ATM. Or, you don't even have to do that. Electronic transfers. So now for the first time in history, it's conceivable that you could buy and sell by simply having a implantable microchip, a mark. 
you say, well, that was probably just doctored up and fixed up, you know, here in recent times. I mean, they wouldn't have known about that in the past. Well, that might be true of some of the new Bible versions, like the NIV or some of these that have been just, you know, the most recent NIV was printed in 2011. So they could have certainly fixed it up to make it look like that prophecy were true. But the fact is, this Bible I hold in my hands right here, I have copies of this. This one I bought probably about 2001, 2002. But I have copies of this book right here, this King James Bible, that go back to 1611. And my 2001 King James Bible says the exact same thing in Revelation 13 as my 1611 King James Bible. And, I bought, and my 1611 is a reprint. You've probably seen it in some of my other videos, but I actually have one, my oldest Bible. King James is an 1840 King James Bible. And it says the same thing as a 1611. It says the same thing as a 2001. How is it that an old book, 400 years old, 402 years old, how is it that that book was able to tell you that there would one day be an implantable microchip? You say, well, that was just a lucky guess. Sure it was. Just keep telling yourself that. This book is God's book, ladies and gentlemen. And if it's right in that area, and it's right in all these other areas too, then it's probably right about salvation and probably right about uh, heaven and hell. And I'm just being sarcastic here. It's not probably, it is right. You need to get saved if you're not saved. But let's continue. Revelation chapter 14. Okay. So you see there the mark of the beast. Now what happens? Revelation chapter 14, jump down to verse 6 there. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now that's something that is very interesting, again, proving that Revelation is not chronological, because we're going to see this in Revelation chapter 17 and 18 as we continue through the study. Okay? Babylon falling here is not it falls and then later resurrects and then it falls again a couple chapters later. No, this is given a, a synopsis of what's going on there in this coming time period. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's continue. Verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, remember the image, the false prophet sets up the image and causes everybody to worship the beast. Everybody in the houses of worship, you know? If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, now look at this, look what happens. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, and who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay, Who's, here, excuse me. here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you see there the, the uh, saint in the time of Jacob's trouble, they are keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus. You say, what's the commandments? Don't take the mark. If you want to be saved, don't take the mark. That's a commandment. And if you keep that commandment, then you're saved. If you don't keep the commandment, you're lost. You say, well, Brian, I, th I think that maybe some people could get saved and take it and stuff. No, you see it says there, if any man there. Uh, verse 9. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Any man. Okay. Verse 11. Whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Whosoever. Any man. Did you get that? That means anyone that takes the mark is damned. Without exception. You say, are there any options? No. Okay? You take it, it's an automatic guarantee that you're going to end up in hell. You see, right now, as I stated earlier, 
If you go out and kill somebody, God will forgive you. If you come to him in a repentant state and you come and you say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I don't want to go to hell when I die. Please, God, save me. He'll forgive you. You can go and you can say, I got drunk. I committed fornication. I had adultery. I had an adulterous relationship and, and destroyed my marriage. I had this. I did that. I robbed the bank. I went to prison. I went to whatever. You can do whatever and get saved. And you say, well, then it's okay for me to sin. Come on. No, of course it's not okay for you to sin. But what I'm saying is, before you're saved, there's not one sin that you can do that God is not going to be willing to forgive you for. But not in this time period. When the body of Christ leaves, you're going to have to keep the commandments and not take the mark if you expect to be saved. And if you start to get weak and say, well, I don't want to lose my job and I don't want to lose my, my bank account and my pension and my retirement and whatever else, so I'm going to have to take the mark. But it's okay because I know Dr. So-and-so over here told me it's okay. You're going to go to hell and you're going to burn and there's no chance of you ever getting out of that thing. No chance. And I'm going to show you later on here in this study, we're getting to it, I'm working up to it. I'm going to show you a very prominent uh, supposed Bible teacher who has now come out and absolutely totally lied to people and said that you can take the mark and still go to heaven. And he doesn't cover scripture. It's his own logical conclusions. That's not logical. Okay, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. All right, Revelation chapter 15. Look over there at Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark... And over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for they, thy judgments are made manifest. So these people that are up there in heaven, did they take the mark? No, it says there they got victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark. Victory. They didn't take the mark. They did not bow before this beast, this antichrist. They didn't take it. Remember that. Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Every time it shows up, by the way, when you see the mark of the beast, it's always, and worshipped his image, and worshipped the beast. Two things are going on there. There's worship of the beast, and there's taking the mark. So don't ever let anybody say, well, you can take the mark as, and not worship the beast. or something. No, the two are, are tied together. If you're going to take the mark, then you're worshiping the beast. That's going to be a requirement. All right? So, again, we see, what do we see here? We see God having a very special wrath. I mean, this is before he's even putting these people in hell. And he's putting a, a noisome and grievous sore upon them. Those that take the mark. Took the mark. Hmm. I mean, if you can take the mark and be saved, what's God doing putting a noisome and grievous sore on you? Wouldn't that be kind of a strange thing to do to people that are actually saved? They took the mark and now they're saved because they went back to God or something? Doesn't make any sense. Jump down to verse 8 there in Revelation chapter 16. It says here, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with, great, or with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. That's going to be the mental condition of the people that have taken the mark. They don't repent, even after they see God's hand and see that God is punishing them. They don't repent. 
And it's pretty much like their leaders. Let's continue here. Verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So these people blaspheme God, they hate God, they don't want anything to do with God. Who are those people? The ones that worship the beast and take his mark. And the beast himself. You see? So you say, well, I could be part of that and then later come back to God. No, you can't. If you get into that system, you are finished. Something happens to you mentally at that point in time. You will hate God. You will blaspheme God. You take that mark. It's not that people take the mark and later on they go, Oh, I really think I shouldn't have taken the mark and I think I'd like to get saved now. That isn't it. You take that mark and you're down there and you go, I hate God. I hate everything about God. I hate those stupid saints up in heaven. I just wish I could find a, somebody that hasn't taken the mark down here. I'd like to kill them with my own hands. That's what you're going to be. So it's not going to be a thing of, I took the mark and I'd like to not take it now and I'd like to get right with God. You take the mark, it's because you are lost. You have no chance to get saved after you've taken the mark. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 6. I'm going to show you the system of the false prophet here. It says, and there came out, or excuse me, there, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet collared beast, full of names and blas full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and silk and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the, the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Okay. This woman is sitting on the beast. She's in league with the beast. Now, is there a church out there that calls themselves Holy Mother Church? Uh, I think that would be Catholicism. You say, wow, now come on, Brian, that, you know, this is ridiculous. Okay, what about uh, verse 4 there? The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar. Uh, those are the official collars of the Vatican. The cardinals in red, the bishops in purple. Huh. Isn't that interesting? And uh, what group of people has killed the saints and martyrs of Jesus more than the Catholic Church? Nobody. You say, what about Islam? Where did Islam come from? Islam came from the Vatican. Creation of the Vatican. So, who do you have here? You have Catholicism. And by the way, there it says there that she is the mother of harlots. Okay? She is the one that has a lot of daughters that follow her. Uh, many of them are called Protestants. You say, what was the Protestant Reformation? Well, the Protestant Reformation was a bunch of people that weren't satisfied. They wanted more power, and so they came out and they said... Roman Catholicism is doing this stuff evil, so come over here. I'm going to make my new form of Roman Catholicism. 